Good morning, everyone. You're going to have to bear with me why I am trying to get set up here. For those of you who have not met my children, obviously the young man on the, I guess, your left-hand side is my youngest son, Caleb. The one right next to Caleb is my daughter, Gabriella, and she works at our conference academy there in the country of Norway. And right next to her is my oldest son, Matthias. He's down at Florida Hospital working there in the business department. And right next to my oldest son, Matthias, is his girlfriend. She is a, a student at Southern University finishing up her nursing degree. And the, uh, the character behind them is our host daughter. She lived with us for several years. Her name is Heejin Lee, and she's just a wonderful addition to the family. But that is uh, my family outside my wife and I. Well, today we're going to look at a very important subject, a subject, I believe, that uh, kind of defines us as a denomination. What makes us different than other denominations? And uh, before I begin, though, I want to add something that I shared with you last time we were worshiping together. As you know, I worked at a lifestyle center for five years down in Alabama. I worked with the renowned doctors, Agatha and Calvin Thrash, and I learned many amazing things about health Why I lived and worked at the lifestyle center there. I taught anatomy and physiology and a Bible class. And one thing that I have a burden for is how to keep my mind functioning. In 20 years, dementia will affect over 100 million people within the United States of America. It's rapidly growing Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and various forms of dementia. I had talked about a, an ingredient that food companies put in their products. That is MSG, or monosodium glutamate. It's an amino acid. Now, your brain weighs about three pounds. It's mostly made of water, over around 90%. And you have 100 billion neurons. And those brain cells I mentioned to you communicate through neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. So the brain needs amino acids to communicate from one nerve cell to the next. But if you have too many amino acids in your brain, it's not a good thing. Those excess amino acids can become excitotoxins. Yes, they can impact the brain like alcohol and actually destroy it. So I had mentioned that in a lot of the processed food that we find on the grocery uh, stores today, uh, they add an ingredient called natural flavors. Have you read that before? In, in the majority of cases, natural flavors can be amino acids. So you have to call the, uh, the producer of that product and find out, are those natural flavors amino acids? And, uh, but what I didn't share with you is how to flush the brain of these unwanted amino acids. There are two, well, there are several things you can do, but as far as diet, have you heard of turmeric before? How many of you like Indian food? Okay. Turmeric has an ingredient called curcumin, and the curcumin in turmeric is very good at flushing out the excess amino acids that are stored in the brain. Because I mentioned that if we don't flush out these amino acids, what makes a protein molecule? When you have one amino acid connecting with another, they form a protein molecule. And people who battle dementia or Alzheimer's have what you call amyloid plaque, beta amyloid plaque or tau plaque. So we want to make sure that we can flush out these protein molecules that are in our brain. So if you were to take turmeric every day, that would be one good way in flushing out the brain from the excess amino acids. And another thing that you can do, another thing that you can eat is fresh coconut. Now my wife and I go to fresh times and they have fresh coconut. So I take the coconut, go outdoors with a hammer in hand, 
I smash it open, and then I eat the pulp. We eat the pulp of the coconut. There's something within the coconut that is very good at flushing out the excess amino acids. And then make sure you get good sleep every night. You keep the mind active, not only keeping the mind active, but you need to keep your body very active. So if you're not on a regular exercise program, I would recommend that you start off slow, but, but make sure that you spend some time every day exercising. The only means of communication between God and his creation, you and I, is through what? Through our brains. And if you lose your ability to communicate with family and loved ones, you really don't have much, do you? And God wants us to have clear minds. Now, there is a, a phenomenal doctor, Dr. Russell Blaylock. So if you want to learn more about it, go to YouTube and type in the name Dr. Russell Blaylock. But more and more Adventist doctors now are talking about the dangers of MSG. And when I was in the Michigan Conference pastoring at the Tabernacle Church, uh, our temperance and health director in Lansing was Dr. Vicki Griffin. And she uh, also explained the, the harmful effects of, of what we call MSG. Does that make sense? So curcumin or turmeric, and what's the next thing you can eat? Fresh coconut. How many of you like coconut? Yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, let, let's begin with an additional word of prayer. And by the way, I really enjoyed the number by the choir and the children's story. Man, you were uh, working those angels overtime, weren't you? Indeed you were. Well, let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can come to you this morning and worship you. I pray in a very special way that you, through your Holy Spirit, would be present. Illuminate our minds, give us clarity of thought and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. In the early 1990s, my wife and I moved to a, a state on the East Coast where I was asked to teach anatomy and physiology, biology, and it, it happens when I move too far forward, I think, right? Sorry about that, Alvin. So I was asked to teach science and Bible and take our students out canvassing. I became friends with the principal. I had known him for several years. And one day, the principal came up to me and said, David, do you really believe in a pre-advent judgment? And so I looked at this friend of mine, and I said, whatever do you mean? And he said, you really can't find October 22, 1844 in the Bible. And I really didn't know what I believed about a judgment prior to the second coming. Now, as I talked with the principal of the academy that I was working at, he revealed to me that he was reading a book by Dr. Desmond Ford. Have you heard of Dr. Desmond Ford before? He was reading this book, and he again, when I was in his home, sitting on his couch, he looked me in the eyes, and he once again said, there really is no judgment prior to the second coming. Don't you know we're saved by grace through faith, not of works? So why would God then judge us by our behavior? And again, I had no idea what I believed as a Seventh-day Adventist regarding this very important subject. Now, in the 1860s, there were two conference officials, Snook and Brinkerhoff, and they would end up leaving the church over the doctrine of a judgment prior to the second coming. Then the brightest evangelist we had in our church, Dudley M. Canwright, left our denomination in 1887, one year before that momentous general conference session. And he left over the doctrine of, guess what? The sanctuary, a judgment prior to the coming of Jesus. Then in 1905, there was a man by the name of Albion Fox Ballinger. And he said, wait a minute, when Jesus ascended to heaven, 
he went immediately into the most holy place of the heavenly temple. So really, since AD 31 to the present time, Jesus has been in the most holy place. He denied a judgment prior to the second coming, and he left our denomination. Then in 1932, a man by the name of Louis Conradi, who was doing a good work in Europe, specifically Germany, sharing the Advent message, began to doubt a judgment prior to the coming of Christ. And he, too, would leave our denomination. Then we know what happened in Colorado, Glacier View, 1980. A most revered scholar and theologian in our denomination who was teaching at Pacific Union College ended up leaving our church over this doctrine called the judgment. And I'm not sure if you've been on the internet, but there's a man that I had dialogued with for several months, Dale Ratzloff, over this concept of the Sabbath, and, or this biblical teaching of the Sabbath and the judgment. And he, too, would leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church and start a ministry attacking the central pillar of our denomination, the sanctuary message. So this morning, to you, uh, this, this morning I, I would like to ask you a very important question. Is there biblical evidence for a judgment prior to the coming of Jesus? Now, is judgment a foreign concept in sacred scripture, yes or no? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, there was a man by the name of Noah. God had raised up Noah to deliver a special message for the people who lived prior to the flood. He shared with everyone, everywhere, that coming judgment was around the corner. We are accountable for our life. And according to the book of Genesis, it said, violence and corruption and wickedness filled the world at that time. So this man, by the name of Noah, started building a boat. And after the boat was completed, he gave one final invitation for people to enter the ark. Sadly to say, only Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives entered the ark. And then the deluge came. Now that story clearly illustrates judgment for those who entered within the ark and judgment against those who what? Remained outside the ark. Then move forward in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 19, there was a man by the name of Lot, and two angels came to the door of his house. They knocked on the door. Lot opened up the door, and they shared a warning message with this man who had compromised his faith. They said, listen, because of the immorality that has filled the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, you and your family must leave. And we know, if we move forward in the narrative, that Lot, his wife, and two daughters fled the wicked city only after the angels grabbed their hands and literally pulled them out. So that story reveals judgment for those that fled the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and judgment against those that what? remained inside the wicked cities. Then I think of the three men, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who thought they could do a much better job in leading God's covenant people into the promised land. This narrative is found in Numbers chapter 5. But God had not chosen Korah, Dathan, and Abiram to lead his people out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, and through the wilderness into the promised land. And they attacked the leadership and authority of God's delegated leader. In that narrative, what happened? Because of their 
their rebellion, their insubordination, God opened up the ground, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, their wives and children were swallowed up. That story illustrates what? Judgment. Judgment. And then that famous story found in 2 Kings chapter 5, there was a prophet by the name of Elisha, and due to his special connection with God, he encouraged Captain Naaman, captain of the Syrian army, to go and wash in what river? Jordan River. And how many times was he to dip below the water? Seven times. And when he came out, what happened to his leprosy? It was totally gone. Now, he was so excited for what happened, his renewed vigor and health, that he came to the door of Prophet Elisha's house with some gifts. When Elisha saw this, this king, uh, the, this, the captain of the king's guard standing before him, he said, listen, I cannot accept these gifts that you're wanting to give me. I did not heal you. It was the God of heaven. And so then Captain Naaman and his soldiers take off. They're heading back home now. But Gehazi coveted the clothes and the gold. He jumps on his donkey and tears off after Captain Naaman. And then once in the presence of Captain Naaman, he said, listen, there has been a change of plans. We have some young men who are going to our school, the school of the prophets, and they could use some tuition money and some clothes. Now, what happened to Gehazi? The leprosy that was on Captain Naaman now riddled his body. That story reveals judgment, doesn't it? And what about poor Moses? Not only were the people murmuring and complaining about his leadership style, but they started, his brother and sister, Arian and Miriam, started to make fun of Moses because he married a woman from the country of Ethiopia. And as a result, what happened to Miriam? She became leprous. And if it wasn't for the, the mercy and the spirit of forgiveness in the heart of her brother Moses, she would have died a leopard. But Moses interceded on behalf of his sister, and as a result, she was separated from the camp for how many days? Seven days, and she was healed. That's a story of judgment. Now, moving forward to the New Testament, Acts chapter 5. The early apostolic church is growing. God is blessing the work of the founders of this church. But they need money to take care of the poor. They need money to advance the gospel message. Now, there is a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they have property. They sell their property. In their heart, they pledge that they would give all the money to the early Christian church to advance its work. But when Ananias comes to the apostle Peter, he comes not with all the money from the sale of the home, but only a small portion. And what happens to Ananias? Huh? He is struck down dead. Three hours later, his wife comes and Peter says, is it true? Did you sell your property? Oh, yes, we did. Did you sell it for X number of dollars? We did, but she lied, not to Peter per se, but to the Holy Spirit, and she, too, was struck down dead. Then men came in, took her body, and buried her like they did her husband. Now, that's a story of what? Judgment. What I'm trying to reveal to you this morning is that judgment is not a foreign concept in sacred scripture. And if you're going to build a theology, you better build it not on one or two verses, but the totality of scripture. So I'm showing you that from God's word, judgment is not a foreign concept. 
why was ancient Israel, why was ancient Israel brought into Babylonian captivity? Why was their temple destroyed? Why was their city destroyed? Because of idolatry. Idolatry crept into the Christian church. So that is a story of judgment. So we're going to look at something very important, the judgment hour message. But there is good news. I'm laying the foundation from God's word. The judgment hour message. Now, these are some of the questions that I would like to answer. And we're not going to get through this whole sermon today by any means. Number one, what does the book of Revelation say about an end time judgment? Does it have to say anything about our accountability to a holy God? Number two, what does the book of Daniel say about an end time judgment? Number three, what did Paul and Jesus say about a future judgment, a judgment prior to the coming of Christ? Number four, when does God hand out his reward? At death, the majority of Christians believe that when a person dies, they receive their reward, either for heaven or hell. But what does the Bible say about the reward that God gives. When does he give it? Number five, what is the standard in the judgment? And number six, is the judgment good news? And one of my friends, Dr. Richard Davidson, shared many insights into why the judgment is good news for God's people at the end of time. So we'll look at that. Well, let's look at question number one. What does the book of Revelation say about and end time judgment. Well, let's look at the context of Revelation chapter 14. I'm kind of a, a big picture guy, okay? Here is the big picture of Revelation 14. There is a special message that goes to the entire world before the coming of Jesus. In vision on the rocky island of Patmos, John surrounded by the rough waters of the Aegean Sea, sees a message going everywhere. And it's illustrated by how many angels? Three angels. Now, the Greek word for angel, angelos, simply means a messenger. So a messenger is carrying a message, and this messenger is pictured flying in the midst of heaven. And notice what he says. He has what? Right, he, everlasting gospel. Now, the everlasting gospel is the message of justification by faith. And a quick summary of that, what does it mean to be justified by faith? Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. If you are justified by faith, your sins are forgiven, your sins are covered, your sins are not held against you. And the Greek word for justification, dikaiosune, means you are regarded holy, righteous, and innocent before God. Isn't that good news? And that is a gift that God gives to us, and we receive that gift by faith alone. So the everlasting gospel is preached to those who dwell where? They dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, and what does the angel say? He says in a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Why? Why? For the hour of judgment is come, has come. Now what follows the proclamation of the first angel's message? The judgment hour message and the proclamation of the gospel a warning about Babylon, and a warning about receiving the mark of the beast. Now, catch this. In Revelation chapter 14, it says, if you receive the mark of the beast, you will drink from God's cup of wrath, undiluted wrath. But here's the good news. Do you know that the gospel can be proclaimed in the third angel's message? You might be saying, well, how do you find the gospel there? Well, go back with me to the end of Christ's ministry. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prayed a prayer three times, Lord, if it be possible, let this what? Cup. May it pass from me. Now, what was in that cup? 
God's undiluted wrath. So here's the good news of that warning message, the most solemn message in sacred scripture. No one has to drink from that cup. Why? Because Jesus already drank from that cup. Isn't that good news? That's excellent good news. So, what follows the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message? It is the coming of Jesus. Notice what the Bible says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the white cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a, what's the next two words? Sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap. Why? For the harvest is come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now what is being depicted in Revelation chapter 14, verses 14, 15, and 16? What is being pictured? The coming of Jesus. Jesus is pictured seated on a white cloud. On his head is a golden crown. In his hand is a sharp sickle. And an angel comes out of the temple and says to him, who is seated on the white cloud, what? Thrust in the sickle. Why? For the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's time. It's time for you to come and gather your children together. So according to John the Revelator, when does the judgment come? Prior to what great event? The second coming. Now every country has a judicial system where its citizens are subject to judgment when they violate its laws. Is that true or false? That's true. Without laws, a country would immediately go into What's the next word? Anarchy. The people who live there would not be safe from bodily harm and their property would be subject to, what are the next two words? Theft and destruction. Now, we know this man, don't we? O.J. Simpson. How many of you were glued to the television when this was going on? I remember as a young boy, my uncle was the head coach of Burnsville High School. He played college football for Gustavus, a private college or small college in Minnesota, and he was the captain on his football team. So I remember my uncle coming over to our house on Sundays, and we would sit and watch the Minnesota Vikings. And I remember sometimes when he would come and the sun had set, we would be at grandmother's house and we would watch college football. And my favorite football team was USC. And I remember as a boy watching O.J. Simpson, the juice, they called him. Do you remember that? Well, we know that he was accused of murdering his wife and a friend of his wife. But because he had a phenomenal attorney, what happened? He was acquitted of murder. Now, I'm not going to ask you guys if you believe he was innocent or not. We could, we could start a debate here. Now, what about these two boys? Do you remember them? The Mendez brothers? They were convicted of the crime of murdering their mother and father. Why did they do it? Because they wanted their inheritance, and they couldn't wait until mom and dad had passed away. Now, what about this guy? Who, what, do you remember his name? What's his name? Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson. And he murdered his wife, who was pregnant, and dumped her body in a bay in San Francisco. He was convicted of murder. And what about this lady? Do you remember her name? What, what's that? Yes, yes. And she was acquitted of the crime of murdering her little girl. So every country has a judicial system. And if we didn't have a judicial system, would you feel safe living in your home? Would you feel safe at work or shopping? No, no. 
so thank the good Lord, there is accountability, right? But what does the book of Daniel say about an end time judgment? Well, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7. If someone came to me and they said, you know, David, you, as a Seventh-day Adventist, you believe that there's a judgment prior to the second coming. I would say, I, I do believe that. But what is the biblical evidence for that? If I only had one chapter in all of Scripture, you, do you want to know where I would take them? To Daniel chapter 7. So we're going to briefly look at Daniel chapter 7. We're not going to read it verse by verse. But as you know, Daniel in vision sees a body of water. And what comes up out of the water? What is the very first animal that comes up out of the sea? It's a lion. Now we know Jeremiah, a contemporary of Daniel, mentioned over and over in the book that bears his name that Babylon would come and surround the holy city and destroy it. But Jeremiah likened the nation of Babylon to being a lion. And Babylon went from 605 B.C. to 539. Now what was the second animal that came up out of the water? That was a bear. And the second nation that came on the stage of history in the then known world were the Medes and the Persians, and they conquered the nation of Babylon. Now, in this picture, it doesn't have three ribs in the mouth of the lion, but the three ribs represent the, the nations or the kingdoms that the Medes and the Persians conquered, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. Now, the next power that came up on the stage was the nation of Greece under Alexander the Great, and Greece went from 331 all the way to 168 B.C. Then following, by the way, what do the, the four heads represent? Do you remember? Cassander, the four generals, right? Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Now let's look at the next one. The next beast that Daniel saw coming up out of the sea was a dreadful, horrible beast that had iron teeth. And this beast had how many head, horns on its head? Ten, right? Ten horns. And so the nation that succeeded the Grecian Empire was the Roman Empire. And by the way, I was there last summer. If you get a chance, I would highly recommend that you go to Vatican Rome and travel all over there. It, it's quite amazing. The Colosseums and the Sistine Chapel, etc. But pagan Rome went from 168 B.C. all the way to A.D. 476. Then we know that the pagan Roman Empire collapsed. It formed Western Europe. And Western Europe ba basically formed from A.D. Uh, 476 to the present. So you had the Anglo-Saxons, the Ten Horns, the Burgundians, the Franks, the Suevi, the Heruli, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, etc. So we have Western Europe beginning to form, and out of Western Europe comes a little horn. And if you look at the characteristics, that little horn power points to the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. And it's interesting to note that this little horn power would rule for a time, times, and half a time. Now, if you look at the rest of Daniel and Revelation, that time prophecy is also called 42 months or 1,260 days. And according to Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 14.34, what does a day in Bible prophecy represent? A year. So the little horn power would go from 538 all the way to 1798. Now, the last of the Aryan powers basically was eradicated, not completely, but they had an army of 200,000, and it was diminished by warfare and plague to 20,000, and eventually they went off the stage of history. Then, at the Council of Orleans in 538, the bishops of Rome got together, and the cardinals, and they wanted to protect the sanctity of Sunday, so there was a significant Sunday law that was approved at that time in that council meeting. Then what happened in 1798 at the end of the 1260 year period of papal supremacy, what happened? Well, Pope, 
Pius VI was conducting mass in the Sistine Chapel, and Napoleon sent General Berthier to capture him because he was fed up with the papacy. Because of the misrepresentation they gave to the people about God. And so he was captured, and the following year he died in captivity. Now, this is very important. This is the reign of the papacy, or the 1260 years from 538 to 1798. Then, what does Daniel see immediately after the reign of the Little Horn Power? So, are you tracking with me? Chronologically, you have Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome. Then you have Papal Rome going from 538 to 1798. Right after that, in Daniel chapter 7, in vision, the prophet sees a judgment scene going on where? In heaven. Let's look at some of the, the, the verses. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like what? Pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels like a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. By the way, that refers to who? Who are the thousands, thousands that ministered to him? Huh? Angels. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Notice carefully the next sentence. The judgment was what? seated, and the books were opened. Then in Daniel 7, verse 22, the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in what? What's the next word? Favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Now, when do the sa uh, saints possess the kingdom? At the second coming. Daniel 7, verse 26, But the judgment shall be set, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. So in Daniel chapter 7, right after the reign of the Roman Catholic Church, which ended, the deadly wound was inflicted on 1798, what does Daniel see? He sees the throne room of Almighty God. He sees millions and millions of angels in that throne room. He sees books that are open and judgment beginning. And what follows that judgment scene? Jesus receives his kingdom, and he receives honor and glory and majesty. And when does he receive that? At what event? The second coming. So three times in Daniel chapter 7, go back and read it, you have the reign of the little horn power, a judgment scene, the second coming. And if you didn't pick it up the first time, you have, again, the reign of the papacy, a judgment scene, the second coming. Well, if you didn't pick it up the second time, Daniel emphatically presents it a third time. The reign of the papacy, judgment, and second coming. Isn't that clear? All in Daniel chapter 7. And these are some of the verses that talk about Christ receiving his kingdom after the judgment scene, okay? So this is the chronological layout of Daniel chapter 7. Do you see that? Boy, that's hard to see, isn't it? Sorry about that. So from 1798 all the way to the second coming, we're living in the time period of the judgment. Now, <laughs> I went to church school and I went to public school. When I was in kindergarten, we had a lost and found box right by the door. My mother and father were not parents that would spoil my brother and I when we went to Target. We didn't have Walmart back then, but we had a Target. You know, I, I've, I've been to Walmart and Target, and when kids fuss and whine, their parents either give them a candy bar or whatever toy they're, they're whining about. My parents weren't like that. But I remember in kindergarten going to school, and right by the door was a box. And can anyone guess what that was in that box? It was a lost and found box, so there were a lot of neat things in that box. There were toys, like matchbox cars, 
and, and rubber animals. And there were two things I liked as a little boy. I loved cars and I loved animals. So I remember one day going up to the lost and found box. I looked in it and I saw these really cool matchbox cars. Not only did I see matchbox cars, I saw some rubber animals. And so I looked over my right shoulder, I looked over my left shoulder, I looked behind me, and no one was watching. So with my little grubby hands, I grabbed those, a couple of the cars, I placed them in my pocket, then with my other hand, I grabbed those rubber animals and placed them in my other pocket, then I went home. Well, I was a little kleptomaniac, believe it or not. And, and I said, man, this is awesome. Mom and Dad won't buy me toys when I go to Target, but I can get some really cool toys at school. So a couple days later, I went to the Lost and Found box, and there were more Matchbox cars and more rubber animals, and I looked this way, that way, behind me, and I grabbed those cars, put them in my pocket, and then I grabbed the rubber animals and put them in my other pocket. Well, eventually, um, I accumulated quite a few toys. And one day I was playing on the living room carpeting in, in our living room, and my mother walked in and she saw all these toys on the floor. And she said, Dave, David, where did you get all these toys? Now for a little boy, being confronted by a mother who's staring straight into his eye. I couldn't look at my mother in the eyes. Do you want to know why? Because I could not say I stole them from school. So I turned my head and I said, um, uh, my, my friends at, at, at school, and I, I started to stutter, G gave me the toys. And she said, look at me in the eyes. And I did. And she said, you're lying to me, aren't you? And I said, no. You know what she did? This is going to crack you guys up. This is going to crack you up. You know what she did? She grabbed a telephone book. She opened it up and said, I'm calling the police. They're experts in de at determining whether little children are lying or not. And I believed her. I was so scared that I, can I broke down and I started crying. And so the following day, guess what? I had a bag full of toys that I brought to school, and I dumped them in the lost and found box. So yes, there is accountability, isn't there? Now, I'm going to kind of close it up right now. We're not going to look at what Paul or Jesus had to say about a future judgment, but you're going to have to hang with me because you're going to discover how beautiful the judgment is. In fact, I'm going to give you a, a preview. David said, Lord, judge me. If you read in the book of Psalms, David said over and over, judge me, O Lord, come on, let's get it done. Why would David say that? Well, we're going to discover for the believer who puts their confidence and faith in Jesus, the judgment really is good news.